I'm Luke Wilson, I work at Conpares and Fox, and I use data and computational tools to facilitate the design of buildings, neighborhoods, and cities. And the case studies I do are gonna follow that jump, a building to a neighborhood to a city, um, on projects all over the world. And I'm gonna kind of mention ways in which using um, data-driven design in these projects across the world can learn from each other. Um, and in a range of projects, from skyscrapers to building clusters to master plans. Um, but given the scale and complexity of these projects, leveraging urban data and computational tools can fundamentally change the design of buildings and cities in several ways. Uh, the first is really understanding complex contexts, specifically dense urban environments, um, increasing the performance of buildings, increasing the speed at which designs can be iterated, increase the speed at which decisions can be made. That's maybe the most, the last two I think might be the most important, and facilitating, facilitating negotiation among stakeholders, because data can become kind of a, a common language that um, developers, planners, uh, everyone can speak. Um, and the way I do this is through creating, creating custom evaluation tools um, for spatial things like sky exposure and views and to correlate um, data sets like Flickr and 311 complaints. Um, and the way I like to frame this methodology is kind of similar to the introduction of the MRI or the X-ray in medicine, where it didn't take away from the judgment of the doctor but a rather allowed them to make more informed decisions faster. So kind of framing this as not giving us the answer, but using data um, as a diagnostic tool. And I think someone earlier was kind of mentioning um, using this as a way to, to kind of understand buildings. And the, the type of data I deal with can be parsed into two types. Um, derived data, which is primarily spatial analysis from the 3D environments I'm working in. So for example, landmark view here. Um, but then also available data sets like Flickr data, Twitter data, um, and starting to correlate those together in a single model. Um, and the workflow that underpins the case studies I'm gonna show, there's a couple key components. One is the integration of competing objectives. So picking kind of simple objectives that are in conflict with each other. So for example, this diagram here shows building metrics such as view, which are in competition with open space metrics such as providing um, daylight to parks. The visualization of the data, uh, maybe about 50% of my time is spent figuring out how to visualize the results of the analysis in a way that people can actually make decisions off of and actually trust. And that'll be kind of a theme of pairing quantitative um, data with a qualitative validation, which is almost kind of seems backwards. Um, the iteration of multiple um, options, so testing tens of thousands of options instead of dozens throughout the design process. Um, and finally, as I mentioned before, using that all to speed along the decision-making process. The first case study I'm gonna show a uh, skyscraper that KPF is doing um, right next to Grand Central Terminal. Um, and I, it, when it's built, it's gonna be to the Spire um, 1501. That one is important because developers are always jockeying for the the, the tallest building within a certain category. And in here, because this was a special permit building, meant that there was discretionary review, we had competing objectives between the client who wanted to maximize things like floor plate efficiency and view, and the city whose ultimate decision was to approve this, who cared about the impact of daylight at the street, sky exposure, um, pedestrian flow, so it was kind of ripe for data analysis. And so at the start of this project, I built this um, metric dashboard where we, tra we could kind of track in relative real time the metrics that we cared about, views, daylight, um, value, and an objectives chart over here in the corner where you can summarize all of those. Um, but making the data, data um, kind of legible and contextualizing it in a way so we understand it. So for example, in the middle here um, is a view analysis showing unobstructed view. But what does that view score mean? Um, no, you know, I don't really know because it's specific to the site. So for this, figuring out a way to get a precedent or a benchmark that contextualizes the data as a reference point, not only for me, but for the lead designer or the client is really important. So in this case, we said, what would the dumbest architect do on this site? So that's this step back building here. And we said whatever we had to do had to perform better across our metrics um, than this design. So we started going through and testing a series of design options, scoring them, and over here, the black line is the dumb, dumb design, and then the green fill are our designs. Um, and eventually, through the process, making a scoreboard where we could start to compare 
these different designs. And the one that we have actually moved forward and developed is the one on the right, which performs um, best across all these measures. Um, also using these tools, so that was testing kind of individual schemes, but a way to not optimize, but rather calibrate your design options. So not looking for the single solution, but a better range of performance within a certain design scheme. Um, and ways of negotiating with stakeholders. So at this point, working with city planning and community boards and quantifying sky exposure between what exists in our proposal on the top and then daylight um, similarly. And that we found through kind of the tapering and setbacks, even though what we're proposing is about twice as what currently exists, um, it, it lets about the same amount of light down to the immediate street level. Um, but since that's kind of hard to intuitively understand, um, pairing it with something like this, where we take some representative spherical projections, which are kind of um, what's going on in each one of these sky exposure squares. It's how much sky is visible from that. And plotting the, the red dashed line is the buildings that currently exist versus our building. And you can see with the tapering and the setback, um, it helps to kind of better understand and validate those responses. Um, the other capacity, um, and you can see kind of the, the shape and form of the building and the, the cutaway that we're doing here. Um, the other capacity we were using um, data and metrics in this process was to engage with city planning on zoning. So this is a digital version of a bulk regulation that's specific to Midtown. And I was told only about eight people understand how to do this. But it's just a spherical projection with some trigonometry to map from 3D to 2D. But building a system where then it normally takes someone about a day who knows how to do this to test a building, but getting it down to 20 or 30 seconds, we then started helping the Department of City Planning study the upzoning they're proposing for the area by doing kind of a peer review and testing their assumptions um, to see if what they're proposing would work. And what we found is it didn't. And so we came up with kind of a matrix of potential revisions that they could choose from and we could work with them to test the impact. So it's kind of several different ways in which we use data throughout this project. Um, the next case study is a um, London residential block, part of a master plan. And we were really, we had a target density both by the client and the city um, that was much higher than what has natively kind of been seen in London. So here's a timeline of different historic block typologies and their density or the FAR um, kind of ranges around two. And the target for this was 4.1 to six across it. And so kind of this is maybe a traditional way to approach the problem. It helped us understand that we couldn't look at historic block typologies, but then we could start to use these evaluation tools to understand why these historic block typologies failed and also show that to the city planners who may favor something like this. So on the left is how it is it exists now on the right is taken to the target FAR. And for here, um, we're looking at um, passing the daylight access threshold, so a proxy for rights to light for London, and then sky exposure, and starting to understand why these fail. And then similarly, evaluating a typology we were developing, which is performing better across those metrics. Um, but with that, um, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. And so understanding this project in the context of some of the work we do globally, so looking at these cities, first density FAR, kind of finding that London, in terms of an av average FAR, um, has more in common with Pudong than Manhattan. Um, but then using data to dig into how we view those cities, um, the density of those cities differently. So this is um, taking view corridors as someone walks along a 10 minute path in both of these cities. And you start to see that the density really manifests differently where in New York, we get kind of these infinite corridors as we get to the cross streets. But London, you never get that because of the nature of the city, which really you're confronted with density in a different way or taking a similar methodology and moving up um, vertically, we're just taking cuts again. You see the way in which New York density starts to, as buildings um, step back, um, you get kind of a, a slow gradient up. London, it's a much sharper change where um, after a certain height, uh, everything's unobstructed and then Pudong is kind of the same all the way across. And the way we started bringing this down is for example, this is Covent Garden as it exists now and this is Covent Garden taken to the density of Midtown New York. So kind of 
through something kind of more qualitatively, we can understand that the block and building types of kind of historic London aren't suited to the types of densities we'd be interested in looking at. Um, so we first started looking at um, finding kind of an ideal block typology where we're maximizing um, FAR while also maximizing daylight, but not finding a single option, but rather a set of high performing options. So down here you can see um, looking at kind of the top 5% from running an optimization and coming up with performance trends and then eventually translating those into a set of design guidelines that the design team can follow and then when we come back into the process, we already know generally it's gonna be very high performing. Um, also working at the scale of the site and doing precedent studies but with data. So taking block sizes from around the world, um, from Portland to New York to some typical London blocks, um, comparing them against the same metrics, daylight and density and the interesting part is we actually found that the London block proportion was actually the best for London. So that kind of uh, was interesting, so not a big surprise there. And then marrying those two together, so kind of simultaneously working at the urban scale, the abstract block scale, and the lessons learned from that, and starting to actually calibrate the block typology for the target density within the site. And so at this point, there's not a lot we can vary, but we can start to really calibrate the street and block network and then look at a range of results. So anything highlighted in pink um, is above average in performance for the data set tested. Um, and in the end, there was only four options, oops, that were all above average. Um, and then those could be taken for le uh, later refinement. It's kind of a cycle back and forth with city planning um, and the design team. Um, and the final aspect of this project um, that's kind of, re well, actually, I think I'm almost out of time, so I'm gonna skip that. So I'm gonna just highlight um, quick some zoning research, so getting to the city level. And one of the things we've been doing is, out of the work on the skyscraper, continue to work with the Department of City Planning as almost um, doing a set of kind of peer review. And so they have a current zoning um, proposal that's citywide, and it's set to impact a lot of, um, a lot of the city, but they typically, they only have the capacity to study typical lots, so orthogonal of set dimensions. And so one of the things we did is first came in, created a set of criteria where here we're filtering of the lots that are gonna be affected, these are the ones that have any likelihood of development. And then next within that subset, we did a series of further filterings where we're trying to identify what are the strange and irregular lot types, and are there enough of any given category that the zoning rules should address those to unlock kind of capacity that otherwise would remain um, untapped. So for example, these are all the lots over 200 feet deep and the majority of them are vacant, um, which is the, the red on the gradient. And so kind of suggesting that the zoning regulations as they exist now um, don't allow these to be developed, so they largely remain underdeveloped. And coming up with ways to help them visualize these and understand um, relationships or kind of commonalities in the geometry of the lots. Um, at the same time, like the other project, working at the building scale, creating a tool where we could connect to the Excel um, file they were using to track all their bulk changes for each zoning district and tie it into a rhino and grasshopper model where we could test their changes, but then they could tweak heights and setbacks um, and get feedback through the process. So anytime this turns red, um, it means that their, their proposed bulk regulations are failing for the density. And so everything I've shown you here has been using off-the-shelf architectural um, modeling software to build an analysis tools and run optimizations, um, but it presents several challenges. And these are all related to each other, um, and I think this relates to a lot of the other talks is running in issues of scalability, especially getting to the urban level. Computation time, where we have to reduce the resolution of the analysis to get um, reasonable computation time. Analy analyzing only tens of thousands of, of results where in fact to really test the parameter space we would want hundreds of thousands or millions of results. And so to that end I've been working with the, we've been working with the computer science department at NYU to create kind of a ground up software platform where we're integrating different urban data sets, um, both static and time dependent like Twitter and Flickr into a 3D environment where then we can start to natively build some of the evaluation techniques um, I've been showing you and deploy them at the city scale, and then start to include statistical analysis and machine learning and deep learning to try to make sense of it, but also optimization. So we recently 
um, we're able to test a million different building um, iterations in under a minute while optimizing for view, which was so much faster than I've ever been able to do. Thanks.